Good evening. I want to just say from the, the beginning that I, I'm so honored to be a, a part of your worship today, to have a chance uh, to be with you all. Uh, working for the conference means that I don't always get to be a part of worship. Usually I'm observing in worship. So uh, I'm really enjoying the opportunity. Just a word before Kent reads our scripture today, I want to give you a little bit of context so that you have an opportunity to kind of be listening for some things as you hear the scripture. First of all, uh, the scripture is basically what we refer to as a Mark sandwich. And uh, it's a little bit long, but it's important that we treat it as one entire piece because all the pieces fit together. And you'll understand that as we talk about it a little bit later, how all these pieces um, fit in such a way that Mark's kind of sandwiched them together. Now, the context for this particular passage is that Jesus has just returned from the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which at that time would have been considered foreign territory. He's now returned back to Galilee, and as you can imagine, the rumor mills and the gossip mills have been running strong, and word has gotten out that he's returned. And so what, as a result, the crowds have increased and so has his position in the community, his status. And of course, also the higher status he has achieved, the more of a threat he becomes to the, to the authorities, which is why it's important. And we, we want to mention that because Jairus is the leader of the synagogue. He's one of the officials. So that's an important to note. But what I want you to be listening to as we listen to the scripture is I want you to listen to all three of the characters, Jairus, the woman with the issue of blood, and the young daughter. And what I want you to be listening for are what are the ways that Mark tells us they are specifically and especially vulnerable. So let us hear a word from Mark. From the fifth chapter of Mark, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and said when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay here your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, she had endured much under many physicians, had spent all she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said, to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of the disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talathakum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of God for the people of God. Mm, thanks be to God. I want to begin tonight by saying that this sermon was written especially for all of you who do not have it together. 
Now, that seems like an odd thing to say, and I will begin by telling you that preachers often preach to themselves. So uh, don't tell them, don't tell Stephanie I told you all that. But the truth of the matter is that when I say this is for those people who don't have it all together, most of all, I mean me. I want to begin by sharing a little bit of a story on myself about my experience in my very first parish, my very first church um, out of seminary, where I was appointed and, uh, as the lead pastor. At that time, I had been invited to participate in a lectionary group that was being held at the gathering with Matt Mayofsky and Terry Swan and, I mean, some of the pastors that I had the absolute utmost respect for, some of the most fruitful, successful pastors we have. So I was both excited and incredibly intimidated because you can imagine, I mean, how many of you remember what it was like to go from being in school or receiving training and then actually having to do the job that you've been preparing for. There, and I don't know how about, about for you all, but in ministry, there is so little that you learn in seminary that ever prepares you for a 60-year-old boiler that is like on its last leg. And that roof that still needs to be repaired. And then that doesn't even go as, I mean, that doesn't even touch things like reports and, um, you know, signs of fruitfulness and managing a staff and crankiness in the middle of ad board meetings. I mean, so you can imagine um, I'm in this crowd of pastors who have had, who've got lots of experience, are very gifted. And whereas I was so excited for the opportunity to be a part of their group, as the months went by and I was just so struggling to keep my head above water, just to keep learning everything I needed to learn and keep things going, I have to tell you, um, I was really afraid to admit to my lectionary friends how completely overwhelmed and inadequate that I felt, especially because uh, we were meeting at the gathering. Now, I don't know how many of you know very much about the gathering, but the gathering is a church start. I now work with church starts. Uh, it is one of our most successful church starts we have in this state. And at that time, when we were meeting as a lectionary, I was just beginning my first appointment, and Matt had just begun uh, the gathering just a couple years before that, and they were going like gangbusters. I mean, they were to the point where they were growing out of their building and looking at um, getting another site. I mean, in all intents and purposes, uh, the gathering's ministry looked so uh, successful and powerful, and um, I was like struggling to hit that 100 mark in worship, you know? And so I was just, it was really a difficult time for me, and I found myself making more and more excuses for not attending because I just didn't want them to know how much I was really struggling just to figure all this crazy stuff out. All right, well, let's fast forward to today. Um, a few weeks ago, I actually heard Matt preach about this particular time that I'm telling you about. And um, Matt was sharing that at this particular time in his ministry, the church was going like crazy, and for all intents and purposes on the outside, he looked like he totally had it together. But the truth of the matter is that this was a time of tremendous testing for him. He was really struggling with a lot of self-doubt, um, but he was afraid to admit to it. Oh, my gosh. It was so... Here we all were... I was trying so desperately to look and seem like I totally had it together, not knowing all the time that some of the people that I care about and, and that I respect the most were having the same difficulties, just at different, in different ways. So what I want to share is that being vulnerable and admitting that sometimes we don't have it all together is an incredibly difficult task, and that many of us can't admit our need because we're afraid. It feels too frightening 
too scary to admit that we don't have it together. But at the same time, I also recognize that for many of us, we're put in positions where people count on us. And so we can't, they need us to have it together, even if we really don't. And so I want to acknowledge that too, because um, I was just thinking about my role as a parent. Now, I have uh, my husband, Steve, who's here. Steve and I, ha our youngest, just turned 16. Matter of fact, she just drove out of the driveway for the very first time by herself because she just got her driver's license this afternoon. I don't have to say anything else. Let me just tell you. you know, my heart is still like way up here. I'm waiting. You know, I'm waiting for that first phone call that says, Mom, you know, I had a fender bender or something's happened. And I know in that moment, I totally have to have it together. And I need to be calm. I need to talk her through it. I need not to be screaming or anything like that. I mean, there's moments when as parents, we have to, we have to hold it together. We have to seem like we've got it together. I was thinking about, um, and that's not just for me. I walk out, I watch my daughter all the time, um, well, all three of our kids, and watch them, all of them, struggle with not letting anyone know that they're maybe having self-doubts about themselves. I mean, especially teenagers. Man, I watch my daughter and her friends, and they all come over, and, you know, they dress to the nines, and they're so worried about not appearing different and not letting anyone know that they might be struggling in, in whatever way that might be. You think we'd get better at this, right? And then we have, I know many of you uh, might be in positions at work where you know, a crisis comes up or there's a problem and people are looking to you to figure out what the solution is gonna be. And that time you do, you need to act like, at least act like, okay, you got it together. You can help them find the answer. So, you know, this is not something that is unusual. I think all of us at some level or another have had times when we've had to at least act like we have it together when we really don't, when we're really feeling vulnerable. And the truth of the matter is that our culture puts so much pressure on success and so much pressure on um, knowing and being, being um, competent in what we do that it feels very scary, very frightening um, to not to admit that maybe we're struggling. So in the scripture today, there are three people who risk uh, being amazingly vulnerable in order to receive life-changing blessings. So let's begin with Jairus. And uh, at the, about this time is usually when I say, and if you have a Bible, get it out. But I love that you have no excuses because it's in your bulletin. So if you want to look at the scripture, I'm going to go through each of these and just talk a little bit about what Mark tells us about Jairus. Now, Jairus, it begins by telling us that he is the leader of the synagogue. Okay, that's significant. In the time of Christ, the social hierarchies are well established. And Jairus would have been part of what we would consider the elite. And yet, Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, who would have had access to all kinds of resources, medicine, access to doctors, and yet his daughter is dying. He's not only vulnerable, he's desperate. And out of desperation, Jairus, Jairus is willing to cross cultural lines and ask this wandering peasant for help. And not only does he ask, but he runs himself to Jesus. Instead of sending someone like a messenger, which is probably would have been the culture and the tradition at that time, Jairus goes himself. He runs. He falls at Christ's feet. And he doesn't just ask. He begs Jesus to come and lay hands on his daughter who is dying. 
And what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't condemn him. He doesn't belittle him. He doesn't criticize him. In the midst of his vulnerability, Jesus turns to him and offers to go to his, do- to his home to see his daughter. But in the midst of all of these events, there's another character that now enters into the story. And this character is a woman with an issue of blood. And by the way, my feminist part of me has to mention, it it always kind of bugs me that we never know her name. But this woman with an issue of blood. My guess is and I'm just guessing because we, don't, we only know a little bit about her with the scripture, is that she had to have been of some kind of elite status. And why do I say that? I say that because she paid for doctors. She paid for many doctors. And on top of that, she was probably a widow because had she not been a widow, the money would not have been hers to spend on doctors. So here we have someone else that's similar to Jairus in that they're part of an elite status in the culture. Now I will also say that it's hard to pinpoint about this woman because the other thing we know about her is Mark says she has an issue of blood. So part of that also tells us that this issue of blood would have meant that she was considered unclean. And so, and, and honestly, if she has an issue of blood, another piece that, if we keep going with this, another piece of her story might be that she has been unable to bear children. And if she's been unable to bear children, that is another mark against her value in this culture. But this woman, despite everything, pushes her way through the crowds to grasp just the hem of Jesus' cloak to receive healing. What's interesting about that is, again, how does Jesus respond? She comes to him in desperation, in complete vulnerability. She's crossed crossed social lines. She's unclean, and she's in the midst of this crowd, and she reaches out and touches Jesus. And how does Jesus respond? In the midst of that vulnerability, he asks, who, he, who has touched me? The power has gone out of me. And then he asked about her story, and she shares it with him. He doesn't condemn her. He doesn't criticize her. He heals her. So in a nutshell, if we were to look at least these two first characters, the context of this Mark sandwich is that those who have used, these two people have used their socially accepted resources, doctors, their position, and always, and they still have not had success. And so they step out of their designated social circles, which is significant. We don't always appreciate how significant that is in our modern context. But they step out of their social circles and join this crowd of low-class folks people in the street, to seek out this wandering peasant, to seek out Jesus Christ. And finally, there is the little girl. It's interesting to me that Mark says, calls her a little daughter, little girl, because she's 12. So actually, in the midst of this culture, she's right on the cusp of being considered an adult because she would have been able to bear children through ministration about, you know, about that teenage years, and she would have been considered adult. But Mark refers to her as this little daughter, because Jairus refers to her as little daughter. This little girl, 12 years old, just on the cusp of adulthood, is about to lose, is losing her battle with life. Her ability to enter into adulthood is being threatened and she can do nothing about it. And Jesus walks in and calls into life 
this little girl who now has the chance to be an adult. And you talk about the ultimate in vulnerability. So each of these three, I want you to understand, come to Jesus utterly and completely vulnerable, and each receives a gift and of life's blessings. So they're not criticized. They're not condemned. And yet, for us, in our, so what does that mean for us in our day-to-day life? Well, I tell you what, it is very hard for any of us in our, whatever our lives may look like, it is very hard for us to admit sometimes our own vulnerability and the fact that we may not know what we're doing or, and that goes on many levels. So what does this mean for us? Well, I think first of all, it means that we need to change the way that we think about vulnerability. In our culture, we avoid vulnerability, admitting we don't have it all together. And I've seen this. Before I became a pastor, I was a chaplain in a hospital. And I will tell you that some of the absolute worst, worst, worst patients, and by the way, I'm one of them. I'm a terrible patient, um, are those people who are used to being in charge. Okay, my husband tell you that might be something in our household. Might just... Okay, being vulnerable in the hospital, oh my gosh, they're the worst patients because it's so hard to admit that. And then I think about the story I began with, with you all, and I was just thinking about how different my life in ministry would have been if I had been able to come to these lectionary pastors that I cared about so much and was developing such a deep relationship, if I had been able to just admit to them how completely vulnerable and how much I did not have it together, as much as I was trying to pretend like I had it together. And how maybe that would have changed things, not just for me, but for others like Matt, to maybe to be able to say, you know, me too. I'm really struggling. So how do we learn to embrace and to be okay with being vulnerable. I think we just have to start with once in a while, we have to admit our vulnerability so that we can receive help, you know? It's okay to say you need help because you know what happens? By owning that, we're willing, it makes us, it invites us to maybe try something different It invites us uh, to have a renewed respect for one another. It invites us to remember that we're not in it alone. It invites us to say, you know, I value you and I value you in my life and I know I can't do it without you. There are so many gifts that can come out of admitting that we're vulnerable. And ultimately, the amazing thing about this is that when we come to God in our vulnerabilities, just like Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood, And this little girl, they all came to Jesus with being desperate and vulnerable. And in the midst of that, they were given brand new life. And it's the same for you and me. We are given new life, graces. We are giving those things. When we're willing to open ourselves up to God, God will fill those spots those places of self-doubt. And that's why it is so important. Um, I so love that you all have communion every Sunday, uh, Saturday. A little slip. Because unlike the world that we live in, where I get it is sometimes difficult to be vulnerable. I get that. It is always okay to be vulnerable at this table. This is where we come in openness and bring all that we have, all that we are, to this table so that we can partake and receive the grace of God. So with that in mind, friends, will you please join me as we begin a prayer? Holy God, creator of us all, we are humbled by the gift of your faithfulness And we're amazed at your steadfast nature, even when we are unsure of ourselves, when we're filled with doubt, 
uncertainty, your faithfulness never ends. And just as you were able to bring order out of chaos, to bring all of creation into being, so too can you speak into our lives and offer us peace and wisdom and strength in ways that sometimes we never even knew possible. God, we come to this table to remember all that you have done throughout the ages and most especially in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen.